Things in the universe that just shouldn't be there. And our mailbag, this is Genesis Week. And a welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the origins controversy made possible by the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education. Excellence in pirate broadcasting, we continue to bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear, and we give glory to our creator while doing it. Remember, you can find us in cyberspace at genesisweek.com where you can subscribe to our YouTube channel to get extras like Crevo rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. Gary wrote in from Michigan with a specific subject request and suggested inviting Dr. John Hartnett as a guest on the show. I thought it was a great idea and Dr. Hartnett agreed. John Gideon Hartnett is a physicist and cosmologist with a bachelor degree with honors and a PhD with distinction in physics, and is currently a professor in Adelaide, South Australia. He's published more than 200 scientific papers, numerous articles and blog posts on science and faith in defense of the Bible. One of his main focuses is how science and particularly cosmology fits the biblical creation account and how the Big Bang is inconsistent with the Bible. He speaks around the world on the creation evolution subject in universities, schools, churches, and the media. He joins me from his home in Idolide, and I probably said that wrong. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Dr. Hartnett. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Okay, so we had a viewer write in specifically to request a topic, namely stuff that shouldn't be there according to evolutionary, naturalistic, and deep time theories. And he pointed to a paper that just came out in Nature disclosing what they call an ultra-luminous X-ray source. Basically, a star emitting an incredible amount of X-ray energy. An article by Business Insider on Yahoo News had a title that said it all, Newfound Super Bright Neutron Star Baffles Scientists and Should Not Exist. So let's start with that. Obviously, they're saying it shouldn't exist in the deep time worldview, why are they saying this shouldn't exist? And does this cause any problems for the young universe worldview? Uh, this is not an uncommon type of headline that you hear because of um, their naturalistic worldview, because of the assumptions that they have in the Big Bang model, they expect certain outcomes. Now we have to understand here, uh, science is about testing ideas and um, science uh, sometimes um, they run into brick walls because of uh, certain underlying assumptions and I would say this is a case uh, where God um, has thrown some surprises there for the astrophysicists uh, when they think that they understand the universe then God throws this curveball so to speak you know and I think that's one of the problems that we have to understand is that astrophysics and cosmology, the, the, the study of the whole universe, falls into really a special category of science. It's not how the, uh, the general listener might think. They tend to think in terms of this notion of experimental or operational science that um, the you know, the scientist does repeatable experiments and then he can sort of absolutely determine some kind of truth from those experiments. Well, with the cosmos, he's looking at data, he's looking at observational evidence, and it's not the same thing as uh, the experiments that uh, I might do in my own research lab. What I would say is that... Um, this type of science falls more into the category of what we would call historical science and because of that it's it's weak in its explanatory power this is something that we do need to understand because uh, astrophysicists can't see the whole universe they can't 
just sort of go out there and look at this object, this ultra luminous object, they can't, um, they, they don't have the same sort of ability to test their models that we do in a laboratory and this is what makes it weak. So instead what they do is they will model that star or that galaxy or the whole universe, whatever it is they're looking at, they'll model that in some computer with some supercomputer simulations and they will try to use that and statistical arguments that come from that to get a handle on what's going on. But it's still very weak because really um, they cannot know exactly what's going on. They they only, you know, they'll sort of um, say that they understand it when their model fits what the observation is and, and often they all go along and think that they have understood it and then something like this happens. I, I would just one add one point further that I mentioned cosmology as well and cosmology is the study of the the whole universe and this problem if, if if you think this problem is difficult even at the astrophysics level like stars and galaxies in this case they're talking about a, a star what they believe is a collapsed star a neutron star um, the, the problem applies to all of cosmology and the whole history of the universe um, I, I like uh, to quote so one particular astrophysicist not a creationist his name is Dr. Richard Liu, and he said cosmology is not even astrophysics because he says all the principal assumptions in this field are unverified or unverifiable in the laboratory. And then he goes on to say, because the universe offers no control experiment. You see, this means there's no independent checks and balances. There's no independent way to test what a typical universe should really look like. And this makes astrophysics and cosmology particularly weak as a science. Okay, so another example, because this is a, a viewer request, another example, uh, this time was a galaxy, documented again in Nature magazine back in 2012, I'm sure you heard about this, a galaxy that was described as rare grand design spiral. Hubble has spotted an ancient galaxy that shouldn't exist. The problem being that this galaxy was allegedly too old at 10.7 billion years old, but it has beautiful spiral arms. Uh, just for the sake of the viewers here, the galaxies are spinning, and as you go out in diameter, these particles have to travel farther than the particles on the inner diameter. So you wind up with uh, spirals in the arms of the galaxies. If the galaxy is spinning for very long periods of time, then basically the particles in the arms spread out and wind up running into each other, and you don't wind up with these beautiful spiral arms anymore. Uh, this particular galaxy, BX442, was so pristine, and yet, according to conventional deep-time dating methods, was too old for such pristine spiral arms. Now, in an, in an interview with the lead author of the study said... The fact that this galaxy is, exists is astounding, said University of Toronto's David Law, lead author of the study. Current wisdom holds that such grand design spiral galaxies simply didn't exist at such an early time in the history of the universe. So uh, give us your input on this, uh, Dr. Hartnett. Why should this galaxy not exist? And does it cause any problems for a young universe model? Well, this, this, this highlights the uh, very problem that I've just already mentioned, this issue to do with looking at the universe like it's some kind of uh, laboratory experiment. Okay, there's, there's two points here that are um, important points. One is cosmology is assumed. Of course, it's the Big Bang, the standard cosmology that is assumed, right? And in that over... We're talking about the overall model, the, the whole history of the universe here. Um, the idea is that galaxies form from condensing gas, and these started to form only within sort of a billion years, even less than that, uh, after the Big Bang, the so-called alleged Big Bang. The second point is, how do they know the age of these galaxies? They use redshift to determine it. They use the redshift in the light coming from that galaxy to determine the age of the galaxy. Now that's 
that is part of the model, the assumed model, right? And, and that's and, a significant point. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. And so because the galaxy will have a large redshift, uh, they will then give that, that age of 10.7 billion years old. But that presents the first problem because uh, they then wonder, well, they've predicted in the past that no galaxies would form that early, but when they find them with that redshift, then they have to admit, because they've locked themselves in, that that, that is the, the, the scenario in that cosmology. But the other problem is that these galaxies should start, because they accumulate from condensing gas, forming stars, the stars accumulating galaxies this way. And by the way, there's no naturalistic way these galaxies can form because the laws of physics um, uh, the laws of physics don't permit stars and galaxies to form by themselves uh, because of compressing gas is the genes limit. You would heat the gas and the gas would res uh, resist the condensation uh, into a star. So they have to suppose dark matter exists in the, to form the stars and galaxies. They, they need that as a prerequisite. But that's another problem. So they start with a uh, sort of baby galaxy and that baby galaxy, as it grows, it builds by accumulating or accreting more matter from nearby and grows bigger and bigger. And in terms of the spiral structure, as the galaxy ages, it should spin more. And as you've mentioned, the spiral arm should sort of wind up. So that's become a major problem. Why don't these spiral arms wind up? And, and they've come up with this... Um, uh, density wave theory trying to explain why, why that doesn't happen. So this type of a galaxy so early in the alleged history of the, un the universe has many problems on many levels. Too mature looking, too soon, and yet still has all its spiral structure when by this time after 10 billion years should be wound up into some sort of amorphous blob, you know. But in a created universe, there's no problem here at all. There's no problem to solve because we we can be looking at the universe just very briefly, very short time after the state that God created it in. I mean, we can be looking at the universe, and this is the view I hold, that we are looking back into the week of creation, day four, when God created the stars and galaxies, and I see no problem because we have a creator God. We're not saying or suggesting or supposing that all stars and galaxies naturalistically form just from hydrogen gas. It's, that pro problem is so, not there. So basically the problem is a man-made problem, basically. Exactly. That's right. It comes from the, the belief system, the worldview, if you like, that all matter started in the Big Bang and therefore all stars and galaxies must have arisen from that gas that eventually... Uh, was flung out in the expanding universe because there is no free out of God. Right. Yeah. Now, uh, it, it was quite entertaining this past summer. I'm sure you followed it. I found it entertaining anyway. Uh, researchers from the Large Hadron Collider, which is a, a huge particle accelerator that spans the border of France and Switzerland, and so the researchers presented a paper at the Royal Astronomical Society's meeting in the UK uh, back in July. They combined the most recent discoveries from the BICEP-2 South Pole Telescope with their discovery of the polarization of the cosmic background radiation. And uh, this led to a flurry of articles. I love what the headline said. Our universe is impossible and we shouldn't exist, Higgs boson scientist says. The Higgs boson should have crushed the universe. Universe shouldn't be here, according to Higgs physics. The universe can't exist. Personally, I hate it when our universe can't exist, and yet I still have to go to work on Monday. So, this is an entertaining education in how science and discovery and anti-creationism works. Because both with the discovery of the Higgs boson and the BICEP2 results, uh, there were atheists jumping up and down and getting very excited and claiming that these discoveries removed God from the picture. Uh, even, even from your area down under, the online Australian news gave a nod to supposedly proving God didn't exist because of all this alleged science taking place. Yep. Now, uh, we, we know what's happened since then. 
but why don't you tell us what's gone on here, literally just in a matter of mere months, with all this powerful evidence for a natural forming God-free universe? Okay, well, let's just start. There's, there's really two, uh, uh, two separate uh, scientific um, uh, announcements involved in this research, two different ty types of scientific research. One is in cosmology, uh, astrophysics, if you like, and the other one is in particle physics that has been uh, performed uh, on Earth in a particle accelerator, the Large Hadron Collider. Now, the BICEP-2 telescope is a telescope at the South Pole. It's a, uh, a telescope that is, has been looking at a very narrow band of wavelengths in the cosmic microwave background radiation. And from their uh, observations, the BICEP-2 team made a, the claim that they were seeing a certain signature in that radiation, this B-mode polarization, that could only come from primordial gravitational waves in the inflation epoch soon after the Big Bang. And then the big claim was that they've discovered inflation and then therefore if you've discovered the inflation epoch, you're sort of proving the Big Bang, this sort of thing, right? Well, there's a number of issues there um, besides uh, the obvious ones to do with um, the created universe. Uh, even the uh, secular theorists were critical of their discovery because they felt that they had jumped the gun and this is part of the problem of cosmology. And the problem there was that in cosmology you can have many theories that explain the same observations and so there are competing theories and one of those competing theorists uh, didn't uh, agree with uh, what they were from promoting in their announcement and uh, he was pointing out that there's alternative explanations and one of those alternative explanations could simply be uh, emission from the dust in our own galaxy and and had that their so-called signature of the inflation have would have nothing to do with the Big Bang not not even anything to do with anything outside our own galaxy the strange part about this is that this uh, so-called discovery was published in the um, Physical Review Letters, which is a very prestigious physics journal. 25 pages in a journal where normally they only give you four, four pages, and sometimes under special circumstances you'll get six, but no more. They gave them 25 pages, and when they published it, half a page was a disclaimer which said we may be wrong. Oh, wow. <laughs> in that half-page disclaimer, they were saying it could be dust from the, uh, the galaxy, um, caught this emission from this dust, and it may be a false signature of this inflation, and everything we've written here, like the interpretation or the conclusion, uh, may be wrong. Now, what paper would be? What journal would accept a paper where the authors are actually saying themselves they may have gotten it wrong? It's quite ridiculous. And they were waiting on the uh, Planck satellite's uh, analysis uh, in this wave, wave band in the same region of the sky to see if they could exclude the possibility of this uh, emission from dust and so on. And uh, this just recently has come out and the data from the Planck satellite is consistent with uh, emission from the galaxy. So it doesn't look very good for the BICEP2 team. However, having said all that, the more rigorous science, which is experimental science, whereas that cosmology, that inflation discovery is really historical science. You know, you have a strong version of science and a very weak version. The weak version tries to construct the unseen past, whereas the experimental science is done in a laboratory and it's repeatable. You can repeat it day in and day out. And with the detection of the Higgs or Higgs-like Higgs boson, this, this so-called God particle, uh, this process has been repeated many times over 
and they now have a very high confidence limit on the detection of a Higgs-like particle. They've narrowed down the energy range of the particle, like its mass, if you like, and uh, they have a fairly high confidence. Now, marrying these two ideas together, remembering that the inflation idea is already pretty well um, dead in the water, but marrying these two ideas together, you get another big problem because the theoretical physics of the Higgs particle says if the early universe began in such a state, now the Higgs field is the field that gives mass to matter, so it determines the a lot to do with the history of that very early inflationary, hypothetical inflationary universe. And without going into theoretical physics details here, um, the observations that were made by the BICEP2 team ruled out the, let's say, the most uh, desirable types of uh, beginnings or histories of the uni early universe in terms of uh, the, uh, the Higgs field, the potential Higgs field. But, um, and, and these are things that are called strong and weak fields. The, the Higgs boson, though, if you apply that, if you apply that to the early universe, that forces them into a certain type of, uh, uh, you might say, evolution of the field, and it forces the universe into rapidly recollapsing back in on itself. So, less than a split second after the Big Bang, according to uh, you know the current thinking, then the universe should have recollapsed back in, onto itself and, sh and, it, and it shouldn't exist. But of course we are here, and we are discussing this, and so therefore something must be wrong. And um, I suggest what's wrong is that there was no inflation, there was no Big Bang, and so applying um, the acceptable uh, particle physics explanation to a uh, hypothetical origin of the universe is where the problem comes, where they come unstuck. So yeah, I agree, it's quite humorous in itself. I've written a, an article on this uh, on creation.com, it's called Inflation All in the Dark, it's also on my own website, johnhunter.org, Inflation All in the Dark, so I go into a lot of details there so the listeners can look that up. Right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today, Dr. Hartner. I, I know how much the viewers appreciate this, as do I. Uh, so thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much for having me. Dr. Hartnett is fairly active on his blog where you can keep up with the latest reports in cosmology and physics as it relates to creation and evolution at johnhartnett.org. He also has two books, Starlight, Time and New Physics, and Dismantling the Big Bang, which he co-authored with Alex Williams. He also has a raft of papers on creation.com, as well as the Answers Research Journal, which I'd highly recommend looking up. Stick around, we'll be back in one minute with the mailbag. The Complete Creation video series is just that, an exhaustive look at the science, philosophy, and theology behind the creation-evolution debate. In this 12 DVD series, Ian Juby starts off with a one-hour presentation for the children in God's Little Creation. He then follows up with almost 11 hours of lecturing for the adults as he walks you through the debate starting at its surprising history and examining the evidence from biology, geology, physics, paleontology, and archaeology. Chances are, any question you have about the creation-evolution debate is answered in this video series. With open captions for the hearing impaired, the series is both entertaining and educational. There are also free resources, such as question and answer and proctor sheets for homeschoolers. You can now get the entire set as an instant digital download or on DVD. Visit Ian's Bookstore today. Get. I'm supposed to cut the blue wire or the red wire? Or I could just pull the detonator. Sheila wrote in on Facebook. 
Thank you for another great episode and for continuing to put out the truth according to the word in a way that only you can do it. You are truly blessed. Well, thank you, Sheila. Bill wrote in. Hi, Ian. A rocking good show. Thanks. Keep up the good work. Where can I pick up a couple of Wazulu t-shirts? God bless Bill. Uh, thanks, Bill. Uh, I ain't got no Wazulu t-shirts yet. I'll see what I can do about that. <laughs> In response to our Eye of the Shrimp episode, Richard Raspberry posted on Google+, Intelligent design overlaps biomimicry, bioinformatics, and computer science. If we accept the obvious fact of design in nature, we would speed up on such discoveries as made in the shrimp eye. This such discovery actually adds hefty weight to design science, despite those militant atheist claims that ID isn't a science. Tell me, what have we discovered due to evolution theory? Can anyone name one thing? And before you say adaptation and natural selection, you best look who it was who discovered these mechanisms. Natural selection was coined by Edward Blythe, a young earth creationist, and adaptation was originally called directed mutation before being changed to adaptation because the term adaptation sounded better than directed mutation to the Darwinists. Despite that, John Cairns, the gentleman who first made the observation of pre-selection expression in phase two self growth, is not a Darwinist either. So what has evolution theory contributed to science? Tharkin73 made a good point on YouTube. Great show, Ian. One thing additionally to point out on C14 dating of artifacts is that even the accepted dates that point to a time prior to the Young Earth creation model are likely inflated to some extent because the method assumes a constant carbon-12, carbon-14 ratio in the system. It has been known for decades that the Earth is not at equilibrium in regards to this ratio. Therefore, the calculated dates are automatically off by some margin. All right, I've got to wrap this up. I'm your host, Ian Jimmy, thanking you for watching, and I hope you'll join me again next Genesis week. Remember, you can send in your comments, questions, hate mail, and large bags of Halloween candy to us in a number of ways. You can email us at comments at genesisweek.com, or you can send us a tweet at Genesis Week, or you can go to genesisweek.com, which takes you to my YouTube channel, find the most recent show, and post a comment there. Or you can leave a comment on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash TV. Remember those words of warning from our Creator and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We'll see you next week. We are a viewer-supported program and need your support to keep this program on the air. Please pray for us, and if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K 2P4. While we cannot offer tax-deductible receipts outside of Canada, donors wishing to financially support the program can do so online at ianjubi.org slash donations, and thank you for your support. Thank you.